Good morning, everyone. This is Jeff Bartels, and I'm going to lead us in a adult Bible class, which you can do either this coming Sunday, 29th, or at your leisure. Um, as you might know, uh, for adult Sunday Bible class here at Bethel, uh, I've been leading some sessions about finding a Jesus in the New Testament, uh, taken primarily from a couple of books. One is by David Limbaugh, Finding Jesus in the Old Testament. And another one is a devotional booklet by Nancy Guthrie called Discovering Jesus in the Old Testament. So we had done uh, previously the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, covered that over three Sundays. And then uh, on the 15th, we went through a, a new section regarding... Um, historical books uh, covering from Joshua through Esther. Well, we didn't make it the entire way, so I thought we'd continue that. We are looking at the types of Christ in, in this study, meaning uh, Old Testament uh, usages by God where you can see uh, Christ uh, portrayed uh, when the New Testament uh, begins. So we'll begin our study with a, a prayer and then devotion. And uh, we have covered uh, so far Joshua, uh, Judges, Samson, and David. And so we'll start uh, from that point um, and conclude the study. So would you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we know that you are a sovereign God, that you are sovereign in the creation of this world, you were sovereign when they, you called your servant Abraham and we, you were sovereign when you called your servant Moses uh, to deliver your people from Egypt. You were sovereign when you placed kings on their thrones in David and Solomon. And you were sovereign uh, in the Old Testament historical books uh, when your people Israel disobeyed you and were exiled to Babylonia. Uh, but then you brought them back, and uh, you kept your remnant alive, uh, and then years later brought about John the Baptist, who would proclaim uh, that there was one coming greater than he, and indeed he was Jesus Christ. Please, with your spirit, be with us and guide us in our study this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I thought we would begin, uh, we had left with a devotion from Nancy Guthrie, and I thought we'd begin another one here to start. Um, this one is called, He Crossed the Kidron Valley. Uh, we talked a little bit about Kidron Valley last time. It's between Mount of Olives, roughly, and where Jerusalem is, a valley which at the time probably was a garbage dump. But uh, we'll look at it from a different aspect here in, in this devotion. While David had been forgiven of his sin with Bathsheba, God told him that there would still be consequences for his sin. I will cause your household to rebel against you. This is from 2 Samuel 12, 11. That day came when David's son Absalom staged a rebellion against the king. So David and his loyal followers left the city. It was a heartbreaking sight. The aged King David, forsaking his palace in Jerusalem, with all but a small retinue, fleeing from his own son. Everyone cried loudly as the king and his followers passed by. They crossed the Kidron Valley and went out toward the wilderness. This is from 2 Samuel 15, 23. In this sad scene, David foreshadowed Jesus in one of the most bitter episodes of his passion. Both were rejected kings, leaving the city of Jerusalem and crossing the Kidron Valley with their little companies of devoted followers betrayed by someone close to them who had joined forces with their enemies. Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, pouring out his heart to them, praying for them, promising the com coming of an advocate who would help them. And then John tells us, after saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered the grove of olive trees. This is from John 18.1. The Kidron Valley lay between the bases of the Temple Hill and the Mount of Olives. The sewage of the city, as well as the filth from the temple sacrifices, continually emptied into the brook that flowed through the Kidron Valley. 
In a sense, it was a place in which filthy sins and iniquities of the people were being washed away from before God's face. It was over this foul brook that David passed on his way to the wilderness and over which Jesus passed on his way to Gethsemane. Christ must have been in this filth-filled brook a picture of a mire into which he was about to sink. The Holy One was about to be encompassed with all the guilt and filth of sin belonging to his people. Unlike David, whose heart was heavy, knowing that he was experiencing the judgment of his own sin, Jesus' heart was heavy knowing that he was about to experience the judgment of God for the sin of the world. Okay, we're going to pick up, I don't know if any of you have the handouts, I think we may try to include the materials here, uh, but we're beginning now on page 4. Uh, we're going to cover First and Second Kings. These two books were also considered one book in Hebrew scriptures. We had said that about First and Second Samuel. Uh, so let's begin our type uh, coverage today of types of Christ with Solomon. Solomon is considered a type of Christ in numerous ways, many of which are demonstrated in Psalm 72, which speaks of Solomon's reign and of Christ's future kingdom. I invite you to read that on your own for your study. I'm going to include uh, some uh, materials here. We'll get into uh, scripture verses in a, in a second. Um, Solomon at the time was given God-given wisdom unparalleled in the world. And you can read about that in 1 Kings 4.29. Let me go there. 1 Kings 4, verse 29. Reads as follows. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore. Paul identifies Jesus as the wisdom of God. So let's take a look at that. That's taken from 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. And reads as follows. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And also from Colossians 2, 3. Let me go there. Colossians 2, 3 reads, In whom are the treasures, are, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And prior to that it says, which is Christ. So again, uh, Paul is referring to Christ as the wisdom of God. And Jesus himself as one greater than Solomon. So is Jesus greater than Solomon? Let's read about that in Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verse 42. Matthew 12, verse 32 says, and this is when Jesus is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, and they're looking for him, a sign from him. But he answered them, and I'm going to read a few extra verses. The evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here, says Jesus. Why will the queen of Sheba stand up and condemn the generation that rejected Jesus? I'll leave that for you to answer. Elijah is also depicted as a type of Christ because God empowered him to perform many miracles to prove he is a prophet. Some believe, however, that he is more closely foreshadows John the Baptist. Like Jesus, Elijah raises a widow's son from the dead, upon which she proclaims, Now I know that you are the man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in, 
is, is truth. This is taken from 1 Kings 17, 24. Similarly, in addition to raising Lazarus, you'll remember that Jesus also raised the widow's son, causing the people to exclaim, God has visited his people. You can see that in Luke 7, verses 14 through 16. And now I'm going to read to you another devotion called The Prophet of Fire, taken from Nancy Guthrie. So let's take a look at that. The Prophet of Fire. Elijah was known as the Prophet of Fire. Fire accompanied many of his most memorable acts, always showing the power of the people, the power of his God. Elijah challenged Baal's prophets to a concept, contest on Mount Carmel as a way to demonstrate the identity of the true God. He set up the contest by having sacrifices prepared and set on two altars. He would pray to God, and the 850 prophets would pray to Baal. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. That's in, taken from 1 Kings 18, verse 24. The prophets of Baal played all, prayed all day in vain. Then Elijah saturated his sacrifice with water. Sure enough, the fire of the Lord came down and consumed the burnt offering and wood, along with the stones, the saturated dust, the waters of the trench. You can read about that in um, 1838. Later, Elijah called down the fire of God on the king's men who came to arrest him, taken from 2 Kings chapter 1. At the end of Elijah's earthly existence, rather than dying, he was caught up into heaven in a chariot of fire. And again, you can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 2. John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. This is from Luke 1, verse 17. Like Elijah, he was a hairy man who wore a leather belt. Like Elijah, he vigorously called God's people to repentance. And like Elijah, John the Baptist expected fire to fall on God's enemies, saying, Even now the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not worthy to be a slave and to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the shaft, with never-ending fire. This is taken from Matthew 3, verses 10 through 12. John the, baptized, John the Baptist was looking for fire, so he was confused when Jesus seemed to be bringing blessing rather than judgment. John didn't understand that Jesus came the first time to offer forgiveness rather than bring down fire. But the day is coming when Jesus will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this can be found in 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter, verses 7 through 8. Let's continue on with another type of Christ taken from 1 and 2 Kings, and this is Elisha. As you remember, Elisha is the prophet who, uh, pro who came then after Elijah when he was carried up uh, to heaven by the chariots of fire. He is a prophet, also identified as prefigured Christ, evidenced by his doubling of Elisha's miracles and his feeding people on two occasions by multiplying their food. I'm not going to read from that, but you can find those on 2 Kings uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 and then continuing in chapter 4 on verses 22 through 20, excuse me, 42 through 44. Elisha's miracles anticipate Jesus' ministry. Elisha helped lepers. Let's read that. Well, you can read that. I'm going to leave that with you. It's in chapter uh, 5 of 2 Kings, but he helped some lepers. lepers. Take my word for it. <laughs> Uh, just as Jesus did, and you know several stories in the New Testament where Jesus did the same. Remember, he healed ten of them, and one of them came and gave thanks before he went to see the priests and uh, declare that he was now healed. Um, he raised the son 
of a wealthy woman from Shunanim, uh, from the dead. That's taken, that story is taken from 2 Kings chapter 4. And similarly, Jesus raised the daughter of a synagogue leader back to life. That is taken from Matthew 9, uh, verses 18 through 25, if you want to read about that. He caused an iron axe to float on water. That's in 2 Kings 6, 1 through 7. Similarly, we know that uh, Jesus walked on water uh, in the storm and called Peter out to join him. He opened the eyes of a servant to see the spiritual reality surrounding him. This is taken from 2 Kings 6 through 7, 6, 17. So let's take a look at that. 2 Kings 6, verse 17. And that reads as follows. And Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes so that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And Jesus, of course, opened the eyes of the blind to see the reality of who he was. Let's take a look at Matthew 11.5. Matthew 11.5 reads, Jesus answered them, and these were the ones that, uh, you remember the story of John had heard from prison about the deeds of Christ, and he sent a word to his disciples to say, are you the one to come, or should we look for another? And Jesus answered him, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Okay, uh, we'll move on now to First and Second Chronicles. Uh, these books uh, offer some unique indications of Jesus. For example, the tribe of Judah is placed first in the national genealogy of First Chronicles. Uh, you'll know that's a large uh, section of genealogy in the first pro book of Chronicles. Uh, but Judah is the first tribe that's mentioned because of God sovereignly arranged and his prophets foretold that the monarchy, the temple, and the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. That's also uh, prophesied here in Genesis 49.10. Let's go look that up quick. Genesis 49 verse 10 reads, And the scepter, that means the, the rule, Will, shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff, from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. David's thanksgiving song to God, which can be found in beginning in 1 Chronicles uh, 16.33, relates to God coming to judge the earth, which prefigures Matthew 25 in which Jesus will come to judge the earth. If you're familiar with Matthew 25, it's where you have the sheep and the goats, and uh, each claiming that either they did or they didn't know that they were serving uh, Jesus in, um, in their ministry and in our lives. Um, and then finally, Second Chronicles highlights Solomon's temple and suggests Christ's incarnation. Let's look that up in uh, Second Chronicles verse 6. Verses 18 and 19. So I'm going there now. Chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. And they read, But will God indeed dwell with man on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. This is Solomon speaking. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and his plea. O Lord my God, listen to the cry and to the prayer your servant prays before you. Jesus invokes a similar sentiment and tells the Pharisees that someone greater than Solomon is in their presence. And we read that earlier. That's taken again from Matthew 12, verses 6 through 8. We move on to the next book in the Bible, Ezra. 
From a long line of priests, Ezra played an important role when the remnant of Israel returned from exile in Babylon back to the Promised Land. Some comparisons to Ezra, of Ezra to Jesus are, Ezra determined to study and obey the law of the Lord and teach others in Israel. That's taken from Ezra 7, chapter 7, verse 10. Let's read that. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statues and rules in Israel. Later, Jesus would perfectly fulfill Ezra's agenda, studying the word from beginning to end and doing it with perfection. Also like Ezra, Jesus determined to obey the law of the Lord. His obedience was not automatic. It was authentic. He did not come to abolish the law, but to accomplish its purpose. We can read about that in Matthew 5, verse 17. And I'll read that to you now. Matthew 5, 17 reads, Do not think, this is Jesus speaking, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Okay? And finally, Ezra, or excuse me, finally like Ezra, Jesus taught the scriptures to the people of Israel. Out on a hillside, from the front of a boat, on a boat, on the water, and in the temple, Jesus taught with freshness, authority, power, and clarity, so that those who heard him said that they had never heard teaching like it. We can read about that in Matthew 7 and verses uh, 28 and 29. And it says, And when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as someone who had authority and not as their scribes. We'll leave the book of Ezra now and move on to Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a Jewish cupbearer for the Persian king Artaxerxes. Uh, those who have returned from exile are troubled to find the city walls and gates in disrepair. Nehemiah immediately turns to prayer, rever reverentially thanking God of his faithfulness and confessing the sins of the people of Israel. Later, Nehemiah is allowed by Artaxerxes to return to Jerusalem and supervise the rebuilding of the city walls, which is completed in 52 days despite substantial opposition. You can read about that and confirm that in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. Nehemiah, though he is not a type of Christ, uh, shares some of these characteristics. He cares deeply for the poor. Let's read about that in Nehemiah 5. Nehemiah 5, uh, I'm not going to read all of it, but you can look that up. Nehemiah 5, verses 1 through 19, uh, and he talks about the outcry of the hungry and that he took counsel with the nobles and officials and uh, brought them to task. Um, Nehemiah is dedicated to God, as shown when he gives up his position as the royal cupbearer to save his people. He is like Christ, as we read in Matthew 5.17, and Ezra, a man wholly committed to God's law. He also intercedes in prayer for his people, as does Christ. We can see that Christ does that, um, and we'll look that up in Hebrews uh, writer to the Hebrews, uh, chapter 7, verse 25. And that reads as follows. Consequently, he is able to save the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And up prior to that, I talked that Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. Okay? and his high priestly prayer, uh, which is given, if you want to read that, in uh, John chapter 17. Nehemiah exhibits great courage. Like Christ, in defying the people's opposition, 
If you remember rightly, he was trying to build the walls and uh, the people around there didn't like that idea and uh, constantly opposed him and encouraging his disciples to endure and persevere. They worked with one hand on a brick and one hand with a sword. Uh, moreover, like Christ in Luke 19, 41 to 48, Nehemiah, Nehemiah weeps over Jerusalem, and you can find that in Nehemiah 1, uh, verse 4. So let's look that up. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. And it reads, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying for the God of heaven. And that's when he found out that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down, its gates were destroyed by fire. When the building of the walls and gates of Jerusalem, uh, Nehemiah's enemies plot to harm him and stop the work and ask him to come down from the wall and meet with him. But knowing their evil intent, he sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop when I leave it and come down to you? That's from Nehemiah 6, chapter 6, verse 3. Jesus faced similar taunts by his enemies while he hung on the cross, but he refused, in the end, to end his great work and to come down. That's taken from Mark 15, verses 29 through 32. And now we're going to take a look at uh, the book of Esther. That's the last book in this, this study. Uh, Esther records events among a larger group of Jews who remained in the land of the Persians. Though God is never directly mentioned in Esther, many commentators observe that his providence is noticeable throughout this book. Esther's primary importance, according to author David Limbaugh, uh, stems from its demonstration of the overwhelming reality of God's providence, his absolute sovereignty in bringing about his redemptive plan. After all, God's covenants could only be fulfilled if his people are preserved. Other noteworthy parallels to Christ below the surface narrative of this book are Esther risked losing the palace to identify with her people. But Jesus, the ultimate Esther, lost his palace, the ultimate palace, heaven, in order to come to earth and to identify with his people. Um, you can read that in Philippians. Let's go there. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. I think most of you are probably familiar with this, but I'm going to read it anyway. It's a wonderful section of scripture. Uh, it reads as follows. Have in this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God was highly exalted, highly exalted him and bestowed him on the name that is above every name, so that the, by the, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Esther is indeed like Christ, putting herself in harm's way to save her people. We read about that in Esther chapter 4, uh, 14 through 16. Let's go there. 14 through 16. She re reads as follows. For if, this is uh, Mordecai talking to Esther, urging her to uh, uh, confront the king. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, go, Gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I, I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Esther's intercession, like Christ, is not based on the merits of the people whom she advocates, but on her love for her people. 
Her success in delivering her people, like Christ, is not based on their worthiness, but upon the king's love for the intercessor. In our case, the father's love for his son. God provincially brings deliverance for his people through Esther, prefiguring final deliverance through Christ. God the Father's edict to punish sin has gone out throughout the world. This is my rule. The person who sins is the one who will die. This is from Ezekiel 18.4, and it cannot be reversed. But our mediator, Jesus, has gone to our king, that the sentence of death be passed down, not on us, but on him. Jesus knew his time had come. Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, Jesus said. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But it is for this very reason that I came. That is taken from John 12, verses 23 and 27. Let us close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of studying in your word, some of the historical books, and looking at the types of Christ in some of those books. Lord, you prefigured your self throughout the ages, showing us how you would come through sacrifices, through how you came through the Passover and the meaning that's embedded in that and how through each of these servants of you, you extended a remnant in Israel uh, that you might be born into this world to save this world from their sins. Guide and direct us in this hour to turn to you and to your word and to trust always in your promises. For you will rise again upon this earth and raise each and every one of us to be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and have a good day.